speakers who's waiting to be let into the room, so, but he's not the first one, so that's okay. So um, thank you very much for being here. Welcome to what is effectively the library session at Confintea 7. Um, my name is Stephen Weiber. I am Director for um, Policy and Advocacy at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. We are the global organisation that brings together libraries of all types all around the world. Um, we're focused both on working with the sector to promote good practices, to promote great ideas, innovations, that ensure that libraries really are doing all they can to support learning, to support research. But we're also there to bring the message about what libraries are doing to these sorts of meetings, to global meetings. Um, the title that we have chosen for this session is a little pretentious, I apologise for this, in substance and in spirit, how libraries are delivering the SDGs through adult education. I'll explain a little bit more as we go along. So it's always good um, discipline to think about what our goals are. What do we want to get out of the next hour and 10 minutes that we have together? Um, and so first of all, it's just going to be doing a little bit of a, an SDGs 101 exercise. Just a little reminder of why it is that the SDGs are different to everything else that's out there why the SDGs are different to what came before, and what this means for the way that we should think about adult learning, the place of adult learning in broader development agendas, and how we actually go about delivering it. Um, and uh, yeah, and because I don't know, we've heard quite a lot already about the place of adult learning in the SDGs, but I think we, we can go broader, and I think there's, there's, there's some real, there's gold out there. There are things that are really helpful for us. Secondly, and this will be the main part of the presentation, is looking at how libraries, library approaches to adult learning integrate some of these unique characteristics of the SDGs, some of these themes. How working with libraries enables us really to deliver the on adult learning within the context of the SDGs. And we'll have three speakers focusing on this. We wish we'd had a fourth, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later who will provide their insights on how this is being done, the elements of this. And the third of this is what more we can do together, because we're not talking about libraries saving the world on their own. We're really talking about partnerships, how we can make sure that we're bringing libraries in alongside all of the other really essential actors in the adult learning and adult and lifelong learning space, civil society, formal providers, and so on how we can make the most of those links, what we need to tweak, what we need to change. And we'll be hoping to get some ideas also from our panelists on this one. Um, we have three fantastic speakers with us today. Um, they are joining us at times ranging from half past three in the morning to half past six in the evening. This is definitely a hybrid session. This is definitely what hybrid looks like. You have one person up on the stage and some empty chairs and a Zoom room. Um, but it means we have a really good diversity of contributions from Australia, from Singapore, from Chile. Um, sadly, Willy Ngaka, who you might have seen on any communication about this before, is unable to join us. He works in Makerere University in, uh, in, 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 um, in Uganda. Um, unfortunately, he's not been able to join us. He would have been coming to talk about the place of community libraries, of rural libraries, and offering insights into how these libraries can be cause, they can be the nucleus of community learning centres, how they can respond to local needs, both in terms of the substance of what's needed and in terms of doing things in a way that really responds to the way that people best learn. However, we do have Lara Pugh, who is the project leader for Learning Cities at the Wollongong City Libraries. We have Zorkifli Amin, who's the head of adult and, and, uh, and adult services at National Library, sorry, at adult and senior services at the National Library Board of Singapore, in Singapore, logically enough. And we have Miguel Angel Rivera Donoso and Bernadita Simian Marin, who will be together joining us. Miguel is the prison library's coordinator, and Bernadita is, the, is responsible for reading promotion, both at Biblio Redes program, at the public library system, and at the at the National Cultural Heritage Service of Chile. We also, I'm glad to say, have as a co-moderator, Lisa Krolak, who works at the library at the UNESCO Institute of Lifelong Learning. We'll be hearing from all of them later. So quickly, the sort of SDGs 101 thing, 101 exercise. Um, now, 
I'm sure you're aware, you have on the screen, I'm sure you're aware of, 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 of the iconography of the SDGs, the images associated with it, the fact that we have 17 goals, 169 targets underneath this. I'm sure you'll most be aware of SDG 4 on quality education, which of course includes the need to focus on adult lifelong education, the need to focus on citizenship education. So we'll hear a lot about SDG 4. However, it's worth thinking more broadly, you know, why are the SDGs different? What, why, why does it mean we should be doing things differently? Not just continuing doing what we did before and just saying, well, now this is linked to SDG 4. What is the change in mindset that we need? And I think that the first thing that it's worth thinking about is that this is an integrated agenda. It is not a set of 17 different policy silos. The whole idea is that if you want to achieve any of the SDGs, you need to achieve all of the SDGs. And so there's this real idea that you should not be picking and mixing, you should not be prioritizing. You need to have this joined up approach and you need to think about how progress in one area may affect others. Typical examples are around the links between housing and education. If you don't have good decent housing, if you don't have electricity, if you don't have light, if you don't have internet, this can make so many activities more difficult. It can affect your health, so it affects people's ability to concentrate, to learn. Mm. Of course, in turn, we will all be very much aware of the positive impact that effective education, and in particular adult and lifelong learning, has on the achievement of everything else that it has on economic growth, that it has on the fight against inequalities, that it has on efforts to ensure greater agricultural productivity and food security. These are all linked together. We can promote, we, we should be promoting how these things are linked together, how success in all of the other 16 SDGs depends on success in SDG 4. Um, this also implies a need for partnership that education actors should not be on their own. Education actors can be working with actors elsewhere, working on climate change, working on innovation, working on inclusion. There's so much potential there, and that's really a, an emphasis, a point that comes out really clearly in the way that the United Nations pushes the Sustainable Development Goals. The second point is that it's an inclusive agenda. The predecessor to the SDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, focused only on development, developing countries. It was very much an agenda for the global south, not for the global north. Now, the SDGs, it's a global agenda. Everyone has their part to play. Mm -hmm. And crucially, there's this logic of leaving no one behind. Success only happens if we can make sure that everyone can enjoy the development, the 17 aspects of development set out here. We need an approach that focuses not just on moving from 50% to 25% or 50% to 75%, we need to be moving to everyone benefiting from sustainable development. And the link to that is this concept of a rights-based agenda. Every individual has a right to the success of the SDGs. And this is a question of governments. Governments need to flex their approach. When we're looking at adult learning in any other area of the SDGs, we can't just have a single way of doing things. We need to find a way of providing services, of providing adult education, in a way that responds to people's needs. And this is incumbent on governments. This is a responsibility of governments. Now, so those are the sort of three key themes of this. Now, these are areas which, of course, we will argue are areas where libraries have a particular strength. Um, they're multifunctional. When someone goes through the door of a library, it can be for any number of reasons. It can be for learning. It can be to find health information. It can be to find the information they need to set up a business, to find about, about the weather reports, when it's good to sow what crops, when it's good to harvest, etc. This focus on multifunctional centers, places that can really help people but achieve progress across the board, is at the heart of the work of libraries. Inclusivity, again, libraries have a universal mission. The UNESCO IFLA Public Library Manifesto sets out these are institutions for all of the community, not just for some. They need to be open, they need to work to make sure that everyone finds their place, gains access to the information and the activities around information that they need. And of course they're rights-based, because libraries are there to ensure that everyone enjoys the rights that they have. Now, of course libraries are just a, a brief introduction to libraries, I'm sure most of you will be aware, but. We are talking about a really significant global network, over 2.6 million 
institutions worldwide on a conservative estimate. At least 430,000 public and community libraries worldwide, that's in the countries for which we have data, about one library for every 15,000 people. In some countries, it's as few as one library for every 1,500 people. So we have a really big, strong, existing network, a network with name recognition, with brand recognition. Um, also, the word network is important here because often libraries are organized in systems. It's possible to actually talk to the whole network. You can organize, you can manage projects, you can do things at a wider scale than just simply in one institution. And that creates some really interesting possibilities for partnership, for working together. So, however, we would argue that potentially this is a, this is a potential that hasn't yet been fully recognized. And we've looked through existing adult and lifelong learning strategies. And while there is, there are many bright spots. Recognition of the importance of libraries in supporting all types of literacy. Recognition of them as having a power as local skills antennae that are recognized, that are familiar, that are known by communities. Recognizing them as being partners bringing unique characteristics that they can combine with the strengths, with the skills of other partners, that's recognized. However, still we would argue not enough. References are often very high level, anecdotal. There's still space, we would argue, to really mobilize these networks in a purposeful way in order to take that potential, to harness it, to use it in order to achieve lifelong learning goals. So I think We'll now move on to, 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 to our speakers. You've got a little bit of an introduction. What we'll now do is then go into this, that subject of the practical examples of how libraries are delivering on net lifelong education in a way that involves partnerships, in a way that is inclusive, in a way that does respond to the needs of individual learners in line with those SDG principles. So first, before I turn to our formal panelists, I would like to hand over the floor to Lisa Krolak at the UIL Library to say a few additional words. So Lisa, over to you. Hello. Oh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. As uh, Stephen mentioned, I am a librarian. I'm the uh, chief librarian at the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, but I also do a lot of research on libraries and advocacy for libraries. So it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, my research interest is the, the role of libraries to support literacy, all kinds of literacy. I mean, don't just think of children when you think of libraries. There it is obvious uh, how, how important libraries are, but so many adults and other uh, people also use libraries to support, maintain, and improve their literacy skills. And of course, uh, use libraries for work-related issues, citizenship, etc. Um, certainly, I think libraries are already doing lifelong learning. We don't have to explain they are a key lifelong learning institution. And today, we would like to think how to better partner with other institutions to best use libraries in a strategic way to reach the development goals that we have in our countries. I have a specific interest on prison libraries, so we will listen to colleagues on this topic, and also on community libraries on how to make sure that in countries where maybe um, publicly funded libraries are a challenge, an issue, or it's also in, in, let's say, richer countries, in areas where communities think we have a need here, can be literacy, can be something else, we have a need to set up something that will help our communities to thrive, so the community libraries I'm also looking at. Thank you. I'm sure we will hear more about libraries together later. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll now pass to the first of our speakers. Each of our speakers will speak for around 10 minutes about their own experience. We'll then have a more sort of ping pong dialogue with shorter questions. And certainly the hope is that at the end we have some time in order for you to ask questions, to make your suggestions. And with that key question of what more can we do? How better can we realize this potential? So. Without further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to Lara Pugh, as said, who is the Learning City Coordinator at Wollongong City Libraries in Australia. So over to you, Lara. Lara, so.
which is just south of Sydney in Australia. Wollongong City Libraries is a public library, which is a part of um, a Wollongong, what we call Wollongong City Council. Uh, there are seven branches across the Wollongong LGA. I come from an education background. I worked in adult education for 20 years. I'm actually not a qualified librarian. And, and I started my role at Wollongong City Libraries just over a year ago. So, Wollongong City Libraries has been offering lifelong learning to support adult education for many, many years. They do this and address the sustainable development goals in many, many ways. So, they work in partnership with um, a refugee support agency and, and provide tech help as well as um, study help and assistance in the library. This can be the facilities as well as some training provided as well. They also work with um, diverse community groups like um, LGBTQI plus to um, host events and promote inclusion across um, the city. There's also work that takes place around tech help with older people as well as um, local Aboriginal communities. So Wollongong City Libraries has always taken um, a lot of responsibility for lifelong learning in Wollongong City Council. However, a few years ago, the leaders of Wollongong City Library looked into this concept of a learning city or a learning community. And they were inspired by this concept of taking a strategic and coordinated approach to promoting lifelong learning for all and addressing sustainable development goals, or addressing all of the sustainable development goals through goal four, 11 and 17. So it's through this investigation that they were able to write a persuasive business case to look into Wollongong City Libraries leading a whole of council citywide project to become a UNESCO learning city. And hence, this is how my role was funded. So I've been on board now um, at Wollongong City Libraries for one year. And when I started, it was thinking, well, how do we do this? How do we become a learning city? So we decided to take a three phased approach to becoming a learning city. The first phase focused on working collaboratively across Wollongong City Council to bring together stakeholders who all use lifelong learning as a tool in their work to support and empower the community. Secondly, the second phase is around external engagement and that's similarly meeting all different stakeholders across the city who similarly use lifelong learning as a tool to support and empower the community. And in phase two, this is where we work together to develop a strategy for Wollongong. Finally, phase three, this is where hopefully we are acting as a learning city. We have a coordinated structure. We have an evaluation monitoring system in place and we are working together to solve complex global problems at a local level. So I'd just like to talk you through some of the key features of what we've achieved so far and where we're, where we're going next. So in phase one of the Learning City project, we, I worked collaboratively across the organisation to understand or develop a more coordinated approach to lifelong learning and community education at Wollongong City Council. We did this by um, bringing together stakeholders from the art gallery, youth services, we have lifeguards, and um, from Memorial Gardens, from environmental education team, um, from community development, as well as from organisational development. All in all, we had around 22 community education stakeholders at the operational level in a project working group. And then we had um, their managers in a project control group. Together, 
we developed a shared agenda for a one year period where we, we thought, what can we achieve in a year to do more, to be more coordinated um, and to improve what we're already doing around lifelong learning. So here in this situation, we see libraries taking a strategic or a leadership role within a broader organisation like a local government. I'm very proud to say there are two or three key outcomes and phase one is now complete. Um, my, I guess for me, most successfully, we have established a community of practice and we have, we have um, education stakeholders who genuinely enjoy coming together and collaborating and knowing what everyone else is doing across the organisation. Secondly, we've established an evaluation framework, and this is going to be piloted in the second half of the year. Now, this is a key theme of a learning city where it's really critical that we can monitor and evaluate the impact of our work in adult education. How do we know we're achieving what we're trying to achieve if we don't have a meaningful evaluation? So the second phase of the project, which sees li libraries taking again, a leadership role, but across the city is working with partners across um, the city, whether they're in the education sector. So formal providers, we have a local university. We also have a vocational institute called TAFE. We have um, public schools, we have private schools, but then we also have a lot of community services organizations who use lifelong learning as a tool and many, many community groups, as well as the private sector. So at this time, we're in phase two of the Learning City project, and I'm having countless meetings, countless briefings with stakeholders from across the city, and we are getting input from them on what their learning values are, on what the barriers are to accessing learning, um, what key themes they really really value and these can align really clearly with the sustainable development goals through this community engagement period we're collecting this data because we hope to develop a lifelong learning strategy for Wollongong that is actually based on a community need in addition to the community need we're also asking our um, partners what could this learning city strategy do for you what can we do to enhance the work that you're doing already? Because there is a lot happening across our city. So the hope is that we are going to be coming together um, later this year. We'll have a lot of great um, engagement data. And with our partners, we hope to co-design a learning strategy for Wollongong. So we're taking a collective impact approach here. So. Thinking about what practically are we doing or will we do as a learning city in Wollongong? We, we aren't there yet. We're in the establishment phase. However, there are a couple of things that we have already started to do that align both libraries, the work of libraries, as well as the, the work of UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities. And one of those is around promoting and celebrating lifelong learning for all through hosting learning festivals. So we, um, Wollongong has been an active member of the Global Learning Festival, which is a free online learning festival that's hosted every year in November. This is led by two UNESCO learning cities in Australia. And we took part last year and we brokered several online events. For example, one was a professional conversation for early childhood professionals around COVID-19 stories of hope and resilience. Um, we also hosted another online international event, which explored the role of universities in learning cities. Participation and in these learning festivals can help to promote the benefits of lifelong learning to residents of all ages. And I really think libraries have a unique role to play 
in not only participating in learning festivals, but also taking on a leadership role in developing a learning strategy for your organisation as a whole, or perhaps as your, for your city. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you today and um, thanks Stephen. Thank you. That's good. Reckon. Thank you very much, Lara. And that was, I, I think there's plenty of things to pick out from there. I know that this theme of libraries as conveners, as a place where you can actually bring together different organizations involved in this space. Um, I'm sure we'll talk more about this later. But without further ado, I would like now to pass on to Zulkifli Amin, who is the Adult and Senior Services Coordinator at the National Library Board in Singapore. So over to you, Zulkifli. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, just let me share my screen, and uh, I hope everybody can hear me as well. Okay, great. All right. Um, let me just breeze through this. I have 30 slides, but let me just uh, see what is uh, relevant, and uh, I'll talk through it. Uh, so once again, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, once again, my name is Zuki Fli. I'm from National Library Board of Singapore. So um, as an introduction to National Library Board of Singapore, uh, we are a network of 27 public libraries, all right, and uh, we, we also house the National Archives of Singapore as well, uh, which comprises of letters, government records, maps, photographs, and uh, interviews as well. Uh, I'd just like to announce that we have two new libraries that just opened and pretty aligned with the SDGs uh, goals um, as well. One is the, if you look at the photo on the top right there, that's the Chua Chu Kang Public Library is a sustainability themed library, all right, uh, which is made of, uh, we've emphasized 100% on sustainability programming and resources as well. Uh, if you look at the bottom, that is our upcoming library, which is a Pongo Regional Library, which is a fully inclusive library, all right, targeting people with disabilities. Uh, all in all, in Singapore, we have a population of about 6 million, right? And just to give context of how engaged our users are, uh, we have a reach of about 65%, right? And a total visitorship of about uh, 11.5 million. So every citizen visits the library on average about two to three times a year, uh, whether to attend programs or to borrow physical books. Of course, this doesn't include the fact that um, many of them use our resources such as ebooks and e databases, which is 80.6 million uh, books borrowed out uh, yearly. Right. So NLB has always been uh, supportive of the sustainable development goals, but my slides today uh, covers on one portion of it, of which I'll make two statements here, which sums up my whole presentation. One, uh, the library cannot do it alone. That's for sure. All right. Uh, we do not exist as a silo entity that is able to achieve all these goals alone. Secondly, um, other government agencies and other even private agencies as well are vested uh, in the sustainability developmental goals as well. And NLB uh, and the library can work with many of these agencies to uh, achieve these outcomes as well. And my presentation today will show some examples of these um, uh, collaborative efforts. So um, National Library Board actually sits in the Ministry of Communication and Information. And you can see the whole plethora of all the other agencies that exist within uh, Singapore as well. And we are working actively uh, with all of these organizations to achieve these um, SDG uh, goals. And uh, I'll show you, I'm unable to show you in a, uh, for the sake of time, all the examples, but I'll show you some of the more significant ones, all right? So um, one of the key things uh, that led to this uh, lot of collaboration was the library, library and archives blueprint or short, in short known as Lab 25, uh, which was set up just recently uh, last year. And one of the things we did was we wanted to understand what was the world anxiety as well as the uh, anxieties of Singaporeans or what are their concerns. And we managed to uh, corner it into four areas. Um, economic disruptions, all right, you can see that happening with the COVID situation. Um, increased misinformation that is happening around the world, all right. Um, loss of national identity. A lot of Singaporeans feel that they, we need to revive that national identity. And most importantly is that no one gets left behind. So this is also uh, mirrors back to some of the SDGs uh, that have been laid out, right. 
And how, uh, and from here, we created four pillars, learning marketplace, informed citizenry, Singapore storytellers, and equalizers as well. Uh, I will go through some of these examples as we move along. So um, this requires, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of partnership with ministries and public agencies uh, to focus on strategic and intersecting areas. What do we mean by intersecting areas? Areas that ministries can come together and they have a common goals that can meet the, the SDGs as well. Right, so um, these are some of the highlights. Right. So to, to give an idea, right, uh, we, the National Library Board, when creating that uh, library and archives blueprint, they decided to focus on eight key learning framework or eight key focus areas, as you can see on the screen, digital, career, sustainability, right, uh, health, reading, arts and culture, Singapore and science. These are the concerns of Singapore. And this is how we are going to position, this is how we position the eight focus areas to achieve the uh, SDGs as well which again maps back to us working with the partners. So one example is through schools on reading. Um, this is a, I'll just breeze through some, some of the children example here. Um, how we actually, the library has uh, incorporated itself into the library, uh, into the school curriculum, right? And um, it has been embedded into the school, how the library presence is, right? And the eight learning frameworks that I mentioned earlier is embedded into the curriculum. So the library plays a role in ensuring that uh, we make recommendations of the titles. And uh, one of the key things is that every student, we have this motto where every student is a reader, every teacher is a reading role model, supporting a reading culture in schools. So from these efforts, uh, Singapore has remained uh, one of the highest literacy rates in the world. Right, and to ensure that uh, no kids are left behind, we have a kids read program, which uh, actually aims at cultivating the love of reading amongst the less privileged families especially families who can't afford to buy books, uh, families who have uh, parents are too busy working that they are unable to um, uh, spend time reading with their children as well. Uh, this is done by volunteers, right? fully done by uh, volunteers and uh, supported with resources by the library. On top of that, uh, to further enhance the uh, efforts of uh, this as well, the kids' efforts, um, what we have done is that pre-loved pre library books are actually distributed to children for the low income uh, family. And on top of that, uh, if you look at the, the image on the right there, uh, we have also uh, allowed organizations to actually take pre loved books from the library, all right, to develop their own uh, smaller libraries, right, within their own organizations as well, especially the social service organizations and charity organizations. Right. Uh, this uh, we also have an initiative called SURE, all right, which is Source, Understand, Research and Evaluate. So one of the key concerns of Singaporeans has always been misinformation. And I think we saw a, a bit of that during the COVID period with a lot of misinformation going around, um, or vaccine information, uh, what works and what doesn't work, uh, which kind of feared a lot of Singaporeans and I guess people around the world as well. Um, what we have done is that we have created this uh, initiative called SURE, all right, and this sure initiative really helps to uh, uh, educate Singaporeans. When you receive a certain sense of info, uh, a certain information, how do you deduce that information is correct or wrong? What are some of the resources that you can use uh, to debunk such information or to check for accuracy? So this is actually something that has been embedded into. Um, many of our programs that are not only within schools, all right, but within workspaces as well, all right, as you can see on the bottom right there, and even uh, within our recruits as well, in our military uh, camps, uh, as part of their basic military training. So digital defense is uh, something that uh, is a forefront of Singapore, especially with a lot of misinformation going around. And all the recruits as a compulsory measure are required to attend uh, a sure training all right, which allows them to understand about misinformation. All right, and another key area that we have found, which is a very niche area, is arts. And we realize that arts literacy is something that's very important within Singaporeans. And through arts, we can push the messaging of the SDGs to our community as well. So arts literacy is something that uh, uh, we do uh, within the li uh, libraries as well, uh, through exhibition and introductory talks workshops and uh, bite-sized video tutorials. And what we do is we, what we call here cross uh, learning framework. So we cross our arts together with sustainability, arts uh, with uh, digital so that people don't get left behind. 
and through this we use art as a medium all right to push the messaging of uh of uh sdgs to our community in a slightly different way all right and uh from here we work with a lot of our partners such as the national arts council under the ministry of uh culture community and youth uh, on health literacy as well, all right. Uh, one of the key challenges of Singapore, uh, Singapore has always be, uh, is dementia, right? Dementia is a growing uh, concern. I think not only in Singapore, but I think worldwide as well. And hence uh, the creation of the health uh, literacy framework, right? And uh, one example is one of the key things we have done is uh, through one of our agent, agency AIC, right, under Ministry of Health where we actively uh, go out to the community, all right, uh, not only within the libraries, but within public spaces as well, to promote uh, dementia awareness, mental health matters, and um, active aging as well. So what does the library do? All right, uh, not only do we uh, push the correct resources, all right, uh, especially on a very sensitive topic like health, all right, uh, but also to direct uh, our users, or our senior citizens especially, to the correct uh, uh, channels, all right, for them to, to seek safe information on their health concerns. So this is just one example, right? So one of the key things we have are national priorities. So what I mentioned earlier, just some uh, collaborative at a government level, at a, at a two ag uh, agency to agency level. But we have, we have, the libraries are also embedded to national concerns uh, set up by other ministries as well. So as you can see on the left there is our Ministry of Communication and Information, right? Uh, where they have a vision to get Singaporeans digitally ready, that nobody gets left behind in the digital world. Uh, for our Ministry of Environment, right, they have a Singapore Green Plan that they hope to achieve uh, by 2030. So for example, by 2030, they hope to have all cars in Singapore to be electric uh, cars. How do we achieve that and how can the library be part of that uh, master plan as well? So uh, when I've been talking a lot about learning frameworks and uh, uh, working with agencies, but how do we embed that, that uh, our partners and our agencies into this information literacy framework? So this is one example that I would like to show you as a snapshot of uh, the digital learning framework. So I mentioned earlier about the eight learning frameworks. This is the uh, digital learning framework. As you can see at the top right there, the broad outcomes, all right? Uh, that is the broad outcome where the library wants to support which is to prepare Singaporeans for a smart nation, empowering them to use digital technology for a better life. And the three sub uh, broad outcomes that we want to achieve, which aligns ourselves with the ministry, as well as align ourselves with the SDG as well. Um, and here we can see the learning outcomes, all right? Uh, that is where the library comes as a role, all right, to achieve these learning outcomes, working with our partners as well. Uh, not only to increase, uh, as you can see, to increase, encourage curiosity and awareness of technology, but most importantly, to, to, to how can the library be at the forefront to drive information, innovation skill sets for problem solving, right? So you can see how is uh, the suggested topics and how it targeted, uh, targets adults and seniors, children and teens. So for example, a typical topic could be, for example, cyber health, safety and wellness, right? Or uh, netiquette or cyber bullying. So uh, one of our key efforts that we have worked with one of our uh, major partners, all right, in terms of the digital learning framework I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the key things that we want to achieve as a nation is to bridge the digital divide among seniors. We have identified seniors as one of the key challenges uh, segment of the community that we do not want to be left behind in terms of a digital uh, advance in the, in, in, uh, in the world. Right. So one example, we have three examples here. I'll just talk about the number two, right? Uh, where we have uh, digital ambassadors, all right? These digital ambassadors are actually volunteers, right? Who station themselves at the library on a daily basis. And any seniors in Singapore who are unsure about anything to do with digital from using their mobile phone, setting up their new laptop, or would like to make that online purchase using their credit card and they are not sure how to do so, can walk in at any time of uh, any period of the day, right, to seek assistance, right? And also, this uh, is helping the lower income families as well, right, with children and adults as well, who uh, cannot afford to attend many of these uh, workshops, digital workshops and uh, uh, courses as well. So this is where our senior, uh, our digital ambassadors come into play. Um, the other thing is that we, have found, uh, we, we are looking into is aligning our national agencies to equip for future economy. 
So not only looking into the current economy, but what is the future economy, understanding uh, the, the skills that they require, uh, including things like, for example, understanding um, future uh, tech uh, like AI, um, and MR, MR technology as well. All right. So one of the key things we work with our agencies such as SSG or the Ministry of Manpower is to uh, how can we curate programs together with our partners as well and support with them with the learning packages all right, featuring NLB's uh, collection. Um, the other area we are look, looking at is, of, of course, on sustainability development, right? Uh, which NLB uh, is embarking on this as a new uh, initiative. All right? So one of the key things we are working with uh, our colleagues on N Parks or National Parks is uh, to really co-create and growing, uh, to grow a repertoire of gardening and nature appreciation programs. So currently, we are starting on a very baby steps of creating programs at the library to create appreciation for the nature, all right, uh, on sustainability topics as well. But one of the key activities we have done, uh, surprisingly, that have worked very well in Singapore, uh, was the seeds distribution at libraries and seeds ex uh, seed exchanges. So um, uh, urban gardening is something that is getting very popular in Singapore, and uh, uh, citizens are coming together to exchange seeds from the plants or from the trees that they actually grow at home. Right, uh, and as well as uh, water as well. So water is a very key concern of Singapore, being in a position where we do not have a natural water resource. Right, uh, water is a very uh, scarce uh, resource in Singapore. Hence, the, uh, the role that Singapore has to play in ensuring that we use our water wisely and how the library can play a role as well. So we do this through our inf information resources, all right, uh, co-curation for our partners for special events at the libraries as well, and we even have a, a water club for children as a learning community. Now, mentioning about learning community, um, I think Lara mentioned uh, a very poignant uh, point that I would like to amplify here, is that the most important, I, I would dare to say this, the most important learning movement that the library has are learning communities. And there are not, no, nothing more powerful than learning communities to drive learning uh, as, a, as a, to echo the lifelong learning banner uh, for the libraries. So for the benefit of everybody out there, uh, if you're not sure what are learning communities, learning communities bring people of common interest together. It could be anything from craft, uh, could be anything from book clubs, uh, to even an IT club as well. Um, so, in NLB, uh, we have grew our learning communities from 50 about two years ago. Now, over 150 learning communities are owned by NLB. All right? And what we do, our, our learning communities, what we do is we empower them to, to leverage on NLB's platform to enhance their learning and to learn and upskill together. All right? And um, most important is the third point, which is to give back to the communities. So, I just use some very practical examples of how our learning communities have actually um, give back to the community as well. So, for example, we have a chatbot learning community, all right, where they learn about the AI tech behind chatbots, all right, and they have created a chatbot in which the public can use to promote sustainability uh, as a messaging. So, basically, this chatbot uh, goes uh, where user can go in and type in any item that they they have in their home. And they can check where can whether that item can be recycled and where can they recycle the item. So this is in the form of an interactive chatbot. Um, on the right is a nature book club uh, that is run by a, a student, all right, um, and they're, they're aspiring to be an intergenerational book club as well, all right. Um, and this is something that is growing, and uh, I would like to say something that's growing. Uh, a lot of our youth has uh, has put sustainability as a very important topic in their curriculum and their personal interests. Uh, just last but not least, right? Um, this is just one example of how uh, impact of uh, of learning communities can do to the wider community. Uh, we had a bunch of uh, comic artists, all right, uh, who meets frequently at the library to talk about uh, to to learn about comic skills. Uh, we got them together and we we got them to draw to draw some uh, comics, all right, to storyboard and create some uh, a series of comics on sustainability in line with the opening of our new library, uh, our sustainability team library. So the message I would like to say here is that, you know, um, as a conclusion, all right, um, the library cannot work on its own in achieving the SDGs. It needs to work with, key, uh, work with key partners to reach the common goals and objectives. And most importantly, it also needs to work with the community. It doesn't serve as a, 
as a uh, one way route just to to uh, extend learning but it can work with the community to reach some of these sdg goals as well and the community can be empowered all right to play a part in achieving this sdg as well and one example i have shown earlier are learning communities all right uh, with that i end my presentation thank you so much Thank you so much, so Kifli, and I, I think you know, that final slide sort of says it all, so I don't even need to paraphrase that, but it feels that that was a, a really great example of combining a readiness to innovate and alignment with policy priorities with some of those unique strengths of libraries as adult and lifelong education institutions. So without further ado, I will now hand over to uh, Miguel and Bernadita in Chile, and thank you for waking up so early. Se les tiene la palabra. Thank you very much for the invitation. For us, it's an honor to be part of this important conference. It would be great to be there in person. But well, well, I am Miguel Rivera, coordinator of the Bristol Libraries program here in Chile, and with me is Bernadita Sinan, my co-worker and the one in charge of the reading promotion area in our program. And today we are going to tell you about our program and our efforts to guarantee access to a quality library for people behind bars in our country, ensuring public access to information, education, recreation, and so many other things that we can get in the library. We know that in general, people behind bars all over the world uh, don't have easy access to a minimum cultural offering. In general, they have access to a primary and secondary school, but not with programs adapted to their reality. Uh, and in the case of reading, we've already seen the personal libraries work group, work visa, that the conditions are very unequal across the world, and even in the most developed countries, there are still many, many things to accomplish. Um, first, I have to say that our program is born from a partnership between our institution that belongs to the Ministry of um, Cultures, Arts, and Heritage, and the institution in charge of prison in Chile. And so far, we have set up 75 libraries across the country. Um, well, our program has one main objective, which is to cultivate uh, interest for reading in people. But at the same time, we promote the use of the library as a space where a lot of interesting things happen. The library houses cultural activities and supports educational and labor processes too. And we also try to support and accompany this meeting many times new between May and everything the library has to offer, which is many times a self discovery process. That is the idea. It's important to mention that our program and every personal library has three crucial elements. Implementation, training staff, and a library revitalization plan. We try to implement a place as welcoming as possible. And um, can we share our yeah. EPT? We have some. I don't think we have access, but we sent it earlier. Apparently not. Yeah. It's possible. That someone share our PPT. Um, only one, only one, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, slides about our libraries and other things. Um, but anyway, um, we try to implement good and beautiful uh, libraries as welcoming as possible, and that in addition to display books, magazines, comics, and computers, um, it's also a meeting place. Uh, a suitable place for all kinds of workshops, movie showings, and other activities. 
Um, it's important to know that we've managed to have an internet connection inside prison only available to the software that allow, allows to register the users and loans through which we have statistics that help us to develop a collection of food as accurate as possible. As for our collections of reading materials, we tailor each collection for the idiosyncrasies of each prison. No two libraries are the same because no two prisons are the same. So consider factors like gender, education level, works practices inside, or number of inmates, uh, we choose the number and types of books and the other materials. Then um, we set up the library, and the first thing we do is training the person in charge and also training some key people in, in the prison, including inmates. But the heart of our program is what we call extension which is everything we do to give life to the library. Uh, I don't know if we, we are sharing yet. So uh, in the next slide, um, we, uh, we found reading promotion workshops we run in each library every year for at least four months. In general, these workshops encourage writing and reading and they deal with common topics like love, uh, food, or religion among others. Actually, we have a workshop called Eat, Pray, Love, like the book and like the movie too. A workshop that has been really significant is one of autobiographical writing called The Novel of My Life that has been really uh, therapeutic for them or you know, take away all what they have. In extension, um, we also have other activities developed either for the library or as the result of different alliances with other institutions or cultural breaks. In general, many people want to run activities in the prison and we try to make everything come together in the library and thus promote the library as a place where interesting things happen. In the next slide, um, we can see um, this is a cinema workshop that is being carried out these days, but it's more than that. It's also a video letters project, video letters between the directors of the movies and in, uh, in Met. Uh, so far, it's turning out very interesting. And here you can see a uh, songwriting workshop, which was held last year. Uh, and it was made by a really well-known singer in the Latin world. She is known as Mon Lafert. And also plays uh, theater representation. And here's some, something important. Uh, we try to make the library not only a physical space, rather a concept. Uh, this activity, for example, was a play where through the Arabian Nights tales, and Chesad, they addressed the issue of violence against women. Then they held a conversation and a writing workshop. Uh, this was this year, last summer, and was addressed just to women behind bars in several prisons in, all across the country. And now they are editing the texts written. We are waiting. Um, well, so much more and so little time to tell all the things that we do. And but we wanted to show you these uh, pictures that we got last week, uh, because we also motivate and even reward initiatives born from the same libraries. And for example, we, uh, these pictures, uh, they are from a little library and they are building a little garden just outside the library to create a good space to, to read in a library that is in the middle of the desert. So this space they are building is uh, it's called the Literary Garden Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Then we have contests, uh, writing contests or other activities to spread the library services inside and outside prison too, and much, much more. 
Uh, but uh, we are running out of time, and Bernardita will tell you uh, one part of our libraries that is a true source of pride to us. Good morning. As you can see here, I'm going to talk about our first, I'm going to start talking about our Digital Resources Center. Um, this is a platform which is housed uh, on servers, it's offline. Uh, it's located in most prison libraries. So it originally, it was designed for digital literacy certification, but given the uh, internet prohibition inside prisons, it became a way to provide a variety of digital content. Uh, however, since the, the pandemic started, uh, all this, our servers were turned off and the internet on to make possible the, the prisoner's family visits and their lawyer's visits. Um, however, to make most of this time, we decided to restructure and update the whole platform. And thanks to partnerships with private and other public entities, we were able to add new content such as uh, Moodle courses in sign language, basic and advanced English, effective communication, and even one which works to train uh, prisoners to work as library assistants. We also included a replica uh, that, the, that the Ministry of Education created for during the pandemic for online study. Um, while social and political changes also were considering the creation of this new design, such as the Haitian migration wave, which motivated us to include a Creole language course. Uh, there is also, as you can see here, are the three sections in the picture below. And the one on the right is a very important one. It's a new addition. And it's a legal advice section in which uh, prisoners can find information about their rights as humans, but also as prisoners, as immigrants, as women, as indigenous people, as LGBTQ, uh, members. Um, well, here in the next slide, I'm going to show you another project we are very proud of, which is a modern game collection. We started in 2019 with a nonprofit, and it consists mostly we selected with in, with a nonprofit uh, storytelling games such as Dixit, Story Cubes. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they are in, in them participants are given conceptual, written, or graphic images, and they uh, create an individual or collective story. So this helps, of course, with reading and right, creative writing promotion, but it also has beneficial impacts and contribute to team building and um, learning and brain development. And lastly, I'm going to talk about our work with the prison guards. Uh, they take the role of librarian. So it's very important for us not only to train them in basic uh, librarianship skills, but also to convey to them the importance and the relevance of libraries inside prisons. Uh, it's a very hard task, as you can imagine. They are guards. They belong to an institution which is very rigid. Um, but we started by placing uh, the same libraries we place in the prisons in their training academy. Uh, we have a also facilitate uh, reading promotion workshops, which are very similar to the ones Miguel was telling you about. Um, well, it's it's been really hard to maintain this uh, during the pandemic, but this year we really intend to continue this work. work. Um, and lastly, we have some numbers that... Yeah, we have a lot of numbers. <laughs> uh, many statistics here you can see some numbers but more than numbers uh, our main impact is qualitative and according some uh, according to some surveys uh, that we have post workshops and what is observed by psychologists and prison staff and ourselves people who read or join to library services reduce anxiety and improve connection with the family members, improve reasoning skills and discussions among other positive benefits. And well, that's it, our program. Thank you again for the Thank you. invitation. Thank you very much. I might ask that the technical team unmutes the floor because I think that our Zoom participants can't hear me. 
I hope that works now. So th thank you very much. I think there was, uh, that illustrated so well, I think, the, the, the possibility, the ability of libraries even to work with some of that, and it, literally most excluded people because they have been, the, the, they're excluded from the rest of society, yet nonetheless, less through adult education lead to positive outcomes. I want to now to move to the second phase, um, and I'm going to ask our panelists a, a series of short questions and then hear their responses. Um, oh, could, could, could the technical team please unmute the floor so that people can hear? <laughs> Otherwise, I may need to write this down. Or I can, this may lead to horrible loop. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yep, that leads to a loop. I'm going to write down my questions in the chat unless the technical team can unmute the floor. Hint. Um, I'm going to have to write down my questions here. Okay, I've sent that message. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, what surprises me is how different our examples are and how different our contexts are, yet the themes are very clear um, to me. So obviously this fundamental principle that Li you know, public libraries were born of this um, desire to provide equitable access to information to people, whether they are young, old, or rich or poor, and how libraries now are progressing that further and taking on lifelong learning and providing those opportunities and the obviously the importance of partnerships across all three of our examples, I think, resonates with me the most. And we see from Singapore the, you know, taking a whole country approach, being a city, a city, um, a city state, um, and then looking at the impact as well of what a library can do to a, a community within a prison. I think it's really, um, really fascinating. And I guess what um, interests me most of all is measuring the impact. And I would like to know more about the impact of the prison libraries and, and knowing, I wonder, you know, when you mentioned, you know, reducing anxiety, but it, it, does it help long-term, you know? And I wonder if this has a really long-term impact on, on these people's lives. Um, thank you, Stephen. Now I will hand over to Zul Kifli, who I've told to go next. Uh, yeah, uh, Stephen, is it a green light for me to speak? All right, nice. All right, uh, yeah. So I think uh, I echo what uh, Lara just said. I think it's, it's wonderful that we have so many examples of uh, from a national level uh, to a city level and even down to a very uh, good example of prisons. I, I, I learned a lot about, um, I, I think one of the key things that probably Singapore needs to do more now, uh, hearing from uh, our colleagues is the, what we can do more for our prisons in Singapore as well. Um, I think that, that's, that's beautiful as well, how we, we can scale it up uh, and take uh, baby steps and different approaches uh, to it. But I think one, one thing that, uh, that works for everybody is that we, we understand and we agree that we cannot work alone with this. And we definitely need to work as a partner uh, in partnership with other government agencies, with the community as well, uh, to get their inputs, all right, so that we can move forward to, to achieve these SDGs as well. So we can't achieve these SDGs uh, just by having libraries doing what their own thing anymore. Um, that, that is the past. Moving forward, I think the library needs to work with uh, many segments of the community, all right, with government agencies, with the community directly as well. Uh, to ensure that many of these SDGs can be uh, can be met, so I think that that what resonates with me for all the three presentations today. Thank you very much. And now I've asked uh, Miguel and Benedita 
to give their response, and then I'll hand over to Lisa for a response. Do we speak now? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, for us, it's really, we were really impressed with your both, actually. Um, both Singapore and Australia, their, your connection with other ministries, especially. For us, it's been really hard to do that because of the constant change of people, actually. They change a lot. Uh, especially in the Ministry of Justice, they give us someone who we talk to and then they change it. <laughs> so it's been really, really hard. Um, so maybe we, we wanted to ask you actually, actually if you have any advice on that. And also, well, our impact studies, which Laura was asking about, um, it's a very complex uh, thing to measure actually, because there are uh, very entities, like very factors which act in there. Um, way to get back to the society. So we believe we basically is a quantitative, I mean, quality uh, what we do. Um, we have the numbers that cross between how they, uh, I mean, if they, if they give back to society, if, if they talk to their families uh, about books, all of that. But we don't have like exact numbers. We're trying to work on that this year, actually. It's one of our main goals because it's really important for us actually to afterwards sell our project <laughs> to, to make to have even more money to do more um, so it's very important for us and we want to ask both of you actually uh, in Singapore you were saying you don't, you want to improve our, your connection with prison libraries and with prison work um, so yeah I wanted to work uh, to know if in both Australia and Singapore how do you work with prisons do you have libraries in them uh, we know a little bit about this uh, because of Lisa, our work with the prison, the world group, the DIFLA. But uh, yeah, we're wondering about that. And I'd like to add something. When we start our program, we were really focused on the impact after the imprisonment. But after a while, we realized that it's really, really important the impact inside, in the life inside prison. So reduce anxiety. It, it have a consequence and reduce the violence in yards inside prison. What is uh, really, really important uh, for the life? Because a lot of prisoners or inmates, they are uh, entering and leaving and entering and leaving uh, from to prison. So uh, it's really hard to think that uh, the library uh, will help to find a work, for example, where a lot of uh, other uh, factors uh, have a um, direct influence in, in that. Uh, family is even more important, for example. So for us, uh, the impact is focused right now, mostly inside the prison. And the user of their time, actually, but they're not in the yards doing something yeah. else, but thinking and talking about issues. And I would also say it's similar to at a city level libraries, we play a, a we um, take responsibility for a goal around building connection and um, improving social cohesion. So it sounds as though whether it's in a city or it's in a prison, libraries have a, a really unique role to play in building um, socially, co you know, more socially cohesive communities at whatever level. We've only got we've only got two minutes left, and we should end on time. So what I will do, and you've probably seen the message go up in the chat, is I want to give Lisa the floor to to say a couple of words about things that jumped out for her, and then go back to the panelists for a final a couple of sentences and a recommendation on what more we can do. So Lisa, over to you. Sorry for this interruption. Um, for me, um, partnership really came up as a key point, but uh, what I also would like to stress is how we would, con uh, we would repeat saying libraries are for everybody and then they shall serve all of community. But I think we had some great example of showing how these different libraries are making a very special effort to reach out 
to uh, excluded communities or disadvantaged people and, and really proactively come up with programs. Also, I really enjoyed hearing about um, how they proactively and quickly um, um, address issues like COVID uh, and then provide health information or make sure misinformation is uh, located. And, and I would like to stress this issue of how libraries can support to bridge the digital divide, how they can, in, in all kinds of communities, be the space where you can go to get free internet access and also to get help. I mean, the senior uh, citizens were mentioned. I think this is also a very uh, great example of libraries um, supporting all kinds of societies. Thank you. It seems that our online panelists can hear this microphone, so let's hand over to Lara. Um, a couple of closing sentences and a recommendation. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear of these case studies from around the world today and um, share this, un understand this, share, this shared need for partnership as well as addressing sort of access and inclusion and promoting lifelong learning for all. Um, I guess my recommendation would be for libraries, if they feel like you know, they're doing a lot and they have a lot of partners and they're doing really well, if they're looking to maybe take a more strategic leadership role to look into the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities and to maybe, yeah, take on that leadership role um, for your organisation and your city. So that would be my advice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Over to you, Zorkifli. Yeah, um, all right, so just some uh, final parting words. Um, I think for today, um, I, I'm i going to bring back some a couple of ideas from our colleagues from the prison uh, library. I have a lot of ideas uh, that I got back and also from Lara as well from uh, the city planner's point of view. So not only I got a chance to share, I got a chance to learn a lot of things as well. Um, I think one of the key things we, we can take away is that, you know, um, working together all right, uh, ministries working together will be very critical in ensuring we achieve many of these SDGs. And, uh, and as what uh, Lisa mentioned earlier as well, uh, I think one of the key critical things we need to do uh, across all nations in the world is to make sure that no one gets left behind. Inclusivity and um, people who are underserved and um, unreached are some of the most critical uh, segments of the community that I think the library needs to start uh, putting their resources in and their energy in as well. Um, so on that note, I think uh, I, I enjoyed the presentations uh, today. I enjoyed presenting as well. Uh, so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you so much, Lokifli. Okay, and, and then over to you, um, Miguel and Bernadita. Yeah, we also want to thank you. It was really interesting, both presentations, to learn about different projects, and, and especially as I said before, the collaboration with other ministries. Um, <laughs> yeah, for us in, in Chile, it's really hard to work in collaboration with other ministries because they are changing uh, people and uh, workers uh, every four years. Uh, so really, <laughs> they change with the political issues. So uh, to he just to hear about, uh, for example, Singapore, how they are connected, for us is um, the the probably the main challenge in the next years. Yeah. yeah, and also say like as a recommendation, um, well, in the case of Australia, in your city, you don't have a prison, so we can do that. We're, our recommendations would be very specifically for prisons because that's the work we do and we specialize in that. Um, but the work with the guards, it's actually very important, which we know it does. it's not commonly done. Um, and also just uh, the whole concept of learning cities is really new for us, <laughs> learning communities. So we'd be, we'd like to know more about that. We'll definitely go to the UNESCO hall. Yeah, information about that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, you, thank you so much. So I think there's some really helpful recommendations coming out of there. I'm not going to paraphrase or anything because I think our speakers have, have, have expressed themselves so clearly. Um, I encourage you, and if, if you're interested in finding out more, we do have some um, leaflets talking about existing work on the place of libraries within adult and lifelong learning strategies. We're happy to put you in contact. We'll be sharing information from our participants. 
and hopefully we can go out and make sure that we're really using this potential, the durability, the potential for partnerships, the recognition, the fact that life is pre-existing and a focus on developing skills, information literacy in particular, in order to really make that full contribution to successful adults and lifelong learning. So with that, thank you very much everyone for your attendance and enjoy the rest of the conference.